in. Welcome to 2020 Leadership Development in Jesus' name. I see the growing leader in you. Forceful leader in you. Successful leader in you. It will happen. The Lord will make you climb all your mountains in Jesus' name. And you will excel in leadership. I, I, I will excel in leadership. Once again, we're happy you are here. And the Lord who has brought you will make you a blessing to all the people he has ordained for you to lead in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for your people. Thank you for our leaders. Thank you for this year, 2020. Lord, we pray that you grant everyone 2020 strength, 2020 ability, and 2020 leadership skill in Jesus' name. Make this year a special year for everyone. Spectacular. That your hand will be mighty upon everyone. Everyone will remain strong in the Lord in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at John. John chapter 10. And we're reading from verses 11 to 14. John 10 verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep, and flees, that the wolf catches them, and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees, because he's an hireling, and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. Today, as we begin a leadership series for 2020, I'm going to look at Christ in his leadership, and then you and I, as we follow in the leadership style, leadership message, Leadership path, leadership progress of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, I'm talking to you on leading the flock of Christ with Christ-like love. Leading the flock of Christ with Christ-like love. As we look at Christ as shepherd, Christ as a savior, Christ as a leader, and Christ as the captain of our salvation. We see the perfection of leadership in Christ. That whatever I was going through, whatever the challenge he had, he always focused on leading the people the way he ought to lead them. Look at chapter 13, John. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. He loved his disciples, he loved the sheep, he loved the saints, he loved his followers unto the end. And then he showed them, what he should do as he bent down in lowliness, in meekness, in humility, and he washed the feet of his disciples. He laid the towel aside and then said, look at verse 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. He said, I've laid down the example of leadership. And I want you to look at all that I've done, not only in washing the saints' feet, but all that he did in leading and guiding them. 
and he said i want you to follow that example leading the flock of christ was christ-like love we're looking at john chapter 15 in john chapter 15 reading from verse 12 john 15 verse 12 this is my commandment that she love one another as i have loved you he said i demonstrated it to you in leadership i loved you and i want you to also follow up that after that love and love one another as i have loved you greater love has no man than this that a man laid down his life for his friends i'll be sending you to every creature and what i have done for you and i took you as friend not as enemy even when you were not very strong when you were weak and when you said things you shouldn't have said i still did not take you as an enemy i took you as a friend and i'm laying my life down for you in verse 14 ye are my friends if you do whatsoever i command you is giving us a great example and he wants us to follow that example and we will follow we're looking at first peter chapter 2 reading from verse 21 leading the flock of christ with christ-like love in first peter chapter 2 reading from verse 21 for ye even here unto were ye called because christ also suffered for us christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that we should follow his steps he has left us an example there are some people that do not understand that there may be suffering in leadership while you are getting to the people you are leading while you are training them while you are helping them while you are lifting them up there might be some suffering there might be some discomfort but it says christ has left us an example he suffered for us so that we will follow after his steps i will follow in first john chapter 3 reading from verse 15 first john chapter 3 verse 16 rather hereby perceive we the love of god because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren in leadership we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren if we're going to follow christ and thank god we're going to follow christ there are things that are very important in our lives number one our salvation an unsaved soul cannot fully follow christ an unrighteous person cannot follow Christ. A guilty sinner cannot follow Christ. A defiled leader, so-called, cannot follow Christ. Number one, there must be salvation. Number two, sanctification. If we are going to follow Christ, it's not by the feet we'll follow Christ. It's our heart. Our heart must be cleansed. Our hearts must be purged. Our heart must be circumcised. And it is that sanctification of the heart, that circumcision of heart, that purifying of the heart, that holiness of the heart, that cleansing of the heart, that purging, total purging, that there's no sin there, no original sin there, and there is no depravity there, and there's no satanic tendency there. It is only such a heart, saved, sanctified, purified, purged, circumcised, that can really follow in the steps of Christ. And actually, Jesus did everything he did by the power of the Holy Ghost. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth of the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good everything he did he did by the power of the Holy Ghost and so it's not enough to say well I'm going to follow Christ and I'm saved thank God you are saved that's the beginning that's the foundation that's the very base of the experiences we ought to have salvation sanctification and spirit baptism that you are filled with the spirit of god <clears throat> and it is that in feeling that in dwelling that saturation 
of the Holy Ghost in our lives that actually makes us now to be empowered and to be endued and to be energized and to be enabled to follow after the example of Christ. As you look at Christ, and you summarize everything concerning the leadership style of Jesus Christ. You write the word leadership. L, he was loving. <clears throat> he was loving. Having loved his own, he loved them to the very end. He coached them because he loved them. He trained them because he loved them. He put himself, everything is God, he put into them so that they will be the kind of leaders they ought to be, El loving. He equipping, equips them. He, well, he didn't just send them out to go and do what they ought to do without empowering them, without energizing them, without enabling them, he equips them. And so as we lead, as we're following the leadership style of Jesus, number one, we love. You keep on loving the people you're leading, and then you're equipping them. Are you bringing up a training program so that you can equip them? Are you looking at their deficiencies and all their needs, and then you're equipping them? Are you energizing them, encouraging them? Eh? He was advancing them, advancing them. Every meeting he had with them, and every challenge he posed before them, he was advancing them and lifting them up so that what they were today, they were not like that yesterday. Every day will be adding something to them. Every week adding something to them. Every month adding something to them. And if we're following the leadership style of Jesus Christ, we're loving people. We're loving the workers. We're loving the members. We're loving the various sections. Whether they have deficiencies or not, and whether they have uh, mean consistencies or not, that's why we're their leaders. We love them all the same, and we equip them, and we advance them, advance them, advance them in knowledge, advance them in understanding, advance them in vision, advance them in consecration, adv advancing them, not advice, but advance, lifting them, moving them forward, D, discipling them discipling them, that everything they ought to know, a day in discipline, then you disciple them so that the discipline of the Spirit will come upon their lives. You are discipling them and teaching them the Word of God. You are discipling them and teaching them the way of the Lord. You are discipling them and showing them what they ought to be and what they ought to do. He exemplifying what you are teaching, exemplifying Jesus gave an example. He said, I am among you as he that serveth. I teach you about service, I serve. I tell you about teaching, I teach. I counsel you about preaching, I preach. And I send you forth to heal, and I, and I heal. Everything he expected them to do, he exemplified. That's leadership. When you can exemplify everything you are teaching, when you can exemplify the doctrines of the Word of God. In your family, you exemplify the doctrines of the Word. In your interaction, interrelationship, you exemplify the Word of God you are teaching are reproducing himself in them. He that believeth on me, the works I do he shall do. And greater works than this shall he do, because I go to the Father. You are reproducing. You are not just uh, saying, do as I do, but don't do as I, do as I say, but don't do as I do. You are the first person to practice what you are teaching. The sound doctrine, the holiness of life, the gentleness in life, and the fruit of the Spirit. You are the first person to exemplify and say, this is the way it ought to be done. When they look at your example, they'll be able to follow your exhortation. You're reproducing yourself in them. Are you courageous? Reproduce courage in them. Are you standing firm? Reproduce that kind of standing up and standing up for Christ in their lives. A life that will not compromise. A life that will not bend, that will not yield. You are exemplifying all that personality development in them. Yes, you are sacrificing. Jesus Christ sacrificed. 
There were times he was tired, he kept on walking. There were times uh, opposition came, he kept on walking. There were times it appeared that the Pharisees would not allow him. But he couldn't stop him. He kept on doing the work the Father had sent him to do. He was sacrificing. He was harvesting. Harvesting. He said, that's why I came. I came to call sinners to repentance. He said, that's why I came to seek and to save the lost in our lives. As we are leading and as we are encouraging other people, we are harvesting. I is instructing. Always instructing them. Always showing them the word. Always showing them, uh, this is the word of God. This is what it means. And these are the applications to your life. P, persevering. Always persevering. That's the leadership style of Jesus Christ. And as we look at Jesus Christ, in everything that he did, in everything that he said, as he trained and taught the people, we too will want to get that from Christ because he wants us actually to follow after his steps. Now, all those ten characteristics I give you loving, equipping, advancing, discipling, exemplifying, reproducing, sacrificing, harvesting, instructing persevering they all finish with ing he didn't just do it and then stopped he kept on doing kept on doing is the constancy is the continuity is the continual thing that he did and so as we also get into the mode and the model and the method of christ teaching we don't just do it and stop we don't do it for this section and stop. We keep on moving on and doing it and doing it. The Lord will give you all his characteristics and implant it in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. I said the Lord will give us his characteristics in Jesus' name. Leading the flock of Christ with Christ-like love. We're dividing the message of very past number one, feeding the church for life and ministry. Feeding the church for life and ministry. That's what Jesus did. He fed the people. He fed his disciples. He fed his followers. He fed the ministers in training. He fed them with the word of God. Number one, for their personal lives. And number two, for the ministry he called them to. Number one, feeding the church for life and ministry. Number two, for bearing like Christ in lowliness and meekness. For bearing. If you cannot endure, you'll not be a leader. <clears throat> if you cannot forbear, you'll not be a leader. If you fly at everything you see, and if you complain about everything that happens, if you murmur because this has happened, that has happened, you cannot be a leader. The Lord Jesus Christ forbore with his disciples. And so as we lead our members, as we lead the ministers, as we lead those who are training, as we lead the workers, we forbear like Christ forbore in lowliness and meekness. Point number three fruit bearing for Christ with love and maturity fruit bearing for Christ with love and maturity that, that's actually the reason why he called us it is to bear fruit you will bear fruit if we say we're leading if we say we're ministering if we say we're preaching if we say we're teaching and training and there's no fruit and there's no result and people's lives are not being touched. People's lives are not being transformed. And we're just doing the rigmarole. We come now, we come again, we come now, we come again. And the people come as they ought to come. But there is no impact in their lives. And there is uh, no impartation to them. And there is no improvement in their lives. Then uh, we're not doing the work. The reason we're doing the work is so we can bear fruit. You will bear fruit. I will bear fruit. And the fruit I bear you too, you'll go and bear in your area of ministry in Jesus' name. 
fruit bearing for Christ with love and maturity. Let's come back to point number one. Feeding the church for life and ministry. That is, for their lives, personal lives. We feed them so that their lives will be what their lives ought to be. And so that their ministries will be what their ministries ought to be. John chapter 21. And I'm reading from verse 15. John chapter 21 verse 15. So when they are dying, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He says unto him, Yea, Lord, yes, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, Feed my lambs. You see, the evidence that we love the Lord is that we care for what he cares for. And we're interested in what he's interested in. And we concentrate on what he concentrates on. He loves the lambs. He loves the young believers. He loves the converts. He'll follow up on them. He'll visit them. He wants them to be strong. He wants them to grow. And if we love the Lord, we will show it on the lambs. If we love the Lord, we'll show it on the young converts. He said, you say you love me more than all these, then give me more time than you give to all those things. And give me more attention than you give to all those things. And give my lambs, and give my followers, and give my sheep more time, more resources, more skill, more concentration than you give to all those other things. Verse 16, it says unto him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He wanted a repetition for a confirmation. He wanted the thing to sink down deep into his heart. He wanted him to say again and reverse all the three times that he denied the Lord. He wanted him to reverse all that. And so he says again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He says unto him, ye Lord, yes Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says, he says unto him, feed my sheep. Don't think the sheep will feed themselves. And we shouldn't think the members will feed themselves. They have all these uh, gadgets and they have all these uh, things they can uh, use to feed themselves if they're really serious. The Bible study is there. The Sunday worship is there. All those things are there on the net. If they were really serious, then they will go there. They'll feed themselves. It says, you show that you love me by feeding my lambs and by feeding my sheep. Some of them are slow, feed them. Some of them are quick, feed them. Some of them are discouraged, feed them. Some of them are encouraged, feed them. Some of them are healthy, feed them. Some of them are sickly, feed them. Some of them are slow to learn, feed them all the same. Don't ever say, I will not, you know, do that again or not feed them again because they are not cooperating. They are not accepting. It's not about they, it's about him, the one you love, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, don't look at their attitude. Don't look at their disposition. I have called you and I've asked you, do you love me more than all these? And you have said, yes. Okay, if you love me like that, feed my lambs and feed my sheep. In verse 17, he says unto him, the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? And the Lord is asking us the same question. And whenever there is uh, maybe any difficulty, uh, you check up on your love. Whenever you say, I don't think I'll go to the meeting today. I don't think I will prepare for the Thursday revival hour today. I think I'll just push it on another person. You're always pushing to another person. And in the previous years, all the time you say you are supervising, you are here on Thursday, and you don't teach, you don't preach, you don't pray. And you reserve all the prayers till uh, the GS will come and then pray for the people. I about your part and the work the Lord has given you. Are you always transferring? 
always transferring the seed to the lower leadership level so that they will do it. They will do it. If there's anything to be done, you stay in your house and just tell somebody standing for me there, they go and do evangelism. That's not love. That's not love. If you say you love the Lord this year, you must bring everything you have into that love. So he asked him the third time, he said to him, the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was great. Peter, don't be great. After all, don't you remember? Those three times, you said, I don't know him. He wasn't that great to abandon you. And then second time, I don't know what you are talking about. He wasn't great to the point. He will not come to you. And then the third time, I don't know what you are saying. I don't know him. And he still came to you. And he's saying to you, go tell my disciples and Peter that I meet, they should meet me in Galilee. If the Lord has shown that love, or restrained love, that love that continued all the time, if he has shown it to you, why are, are you disturbed? That is asking you the third time, lovest thou me? God has a reason. Christ has a reason to ask you over and over and over again. Because he looks at your attitude, because he looked at your time-saving gimmicks, because he looks at your restraint, and because he looks at the limitation of the demonstration of your love, he has the right to ask you over and over, lovest thou me more than all these, more than business, more than your corporation, more than your company? more than your working workplace, more than the market, more than produce, more than traveling. Lovest thou me? Do you abandon my work for your own personal things and then profess you love me? He has a reason to ask us, to ask you and to ask me a number of times. It says Peter was grieved because he said unto him, the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. That's what the Lord is expecting from you and expecting from me. That's the reason he appointed us. Are you a pastor? Are you a preacher? That's the reason he appointed you as a pastor. That you are to feed the people of God. You are to feed the lambs. You are to feed the new converts. You are to feed the young ones and feed them with saving truth. The truth that will save them and the truth that will transform their lives. Look at Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. If you find any pastor who is according to his own heart, I'm not giving that one to you. If you find any pastor who is according to his own self-will, I'm not giving him to you. If you find any minister, if you find any worker who must have his way by all means, even if he destroys the flock, even if it destroys the children, even if it destroys the youth, even if it scatters the flock, they must have their own way. Having their own heart, having their own way is the number one priority of their lives. The work they're given to do and the things they're to minister is not the number one thing. If that is so in any life, the Lord has not given us such a pastor, such a preacher, and such a shepherd. If it's a pastor the Lord has given us, it will be according to God's own mind. We shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. We shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And that's what leaders are to do. And that's what Jesus told Peter to do. And that's what Jesus had told all the other disciples, all his other ministers to do. And that's what the Lord has told us to do. That we will be according to his own heart, according to his own mind, and we will teach knowledge. Feed the people with knowledge. Uh, you know, there are times uh, people might uh, feed us with knowledge, but it's so scanty. And it's uh, so small. 
and it doesn't really feed us. It's like they just whet our appetite and we're still hungry. That's why some of the sheep are going here and there because they're not satisfied. Feed them and feed them to the point they're satisfied and they have knowledge and they know that they know that this is the truth and they will not deviate from the truth and with understanding they will understand the way of the lord they'll understand the path they ought to follow we should so teach that the knowledge of God will not be a strange thing, eluding the people we're teaching. And the understanding will be so clear because we have taught them the word of God. God will help you. And God will keep on helping me. And what God helps me to do, he will help you to do. And amen. Chapter 23 of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 4. And I will set up shepherds over them. I, the Almighty God said, I'm the one to set up. I'm the owner of the flock. That's God. God says, I'm the owner of the flock and the owner of the sheep. And because they're all mine. I'm the one to set up shepherds over them. Not by voting, not politics. It is not by, you know, the majority carries the vote, democracy. No, it is the Lord himself. Who is the chief shepherd? Who is going to set up shepherds over them? And he who sets them up also has the right to put them down. If there not be any fruit, because the reason why he sets up the shepherd is so that they will go forth and bear fruit. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more. Underline that in the Bible. They shall fear no more. When you study any part of the Bible, if the people become more afraid than they were before, they are afraid of the world, they are afraid of the powers that be, they are afraid of powers of darkness, they are afraid of something behind the curtain, they are afraid of this, they are afraid of that. We have not taught them well, and we have not taught the Word of God like we ought to teach the Word of God. If they are afraid of the future, afraid of today, afraid of tomorrow, if they are afraid and they have doubts, am, 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 am I sins forgiven? Am I really saved? Am I really a child of God? And they are always doubting. They are afraid of taking the Lord's Supper. We have been teaching them and teaching them and teaching them. And they will say the Lord's Supper is going to take place uh, this coming Sunday. And they are afraid to even take the Lord's Supper. We're not teaching them well. If we're teaching them well, it says they shall fear no more. Nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. There will be no lack in their lives if we're teaching them aright. If we're teaching and developing their faith. We're teaching and developing their love. We're teaching and we're developing them in the way we ought to. There'll be no fear. There'll be no lack. And so, and it is not, you just don't grab your Bible and say, I'm going to teach. Have you prepared? Have you prayed? Have you delved into the word of God and say, I know the congregation. I know the people. I know their hunger, I know their desire, I know their sickness, I know their insufficiency, I know their need. And then from the knowledge of their need, as you are praying, then you prepare. And through that need and through that preparation, you feed them, all their fears will evaporate. Look at Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Who then is a faithful and wise steward? Who then is a faithful and wise pastor? Who then is a faithful and wise shepherd? Whom is Lord made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? 
to feed them. It's not the rod that's important. It's not the cordial that's important. It's not beating people, bro, beating people that's important. It's not shouting on people, bullying them that's important. It's not making them shiver, tremble that's important. It's not making slaves of them that's important. All that is not the intention of the Lord. He said it is to give them meat, it is to give them spiritual food in new season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. ING. They're doing it, they're doing it, they're doing it. And by the time the Lord comes, they have not retired. By the time the Lord comes, they have not said, I'm tired, I cannot go on anymore. You're not tired to go to your place of work. You're tired to go to church. You're not tired of selling um, clothes. You are tired of giving them the garment of righteousness. You are not tired of uh, traveling to a far place so that you can buy things and sell and make money. And you are tired of reaching out and getting the bread of life from the far country, from heaven, and feeding the people. You see the people that say that they are tired and yet they are expending more energy on earthly things. They really do not love the Lord. The Lord said, Blessed is that servant to me, Lord, when he cometh, shall find so do him. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. He will reward you. He will reward us. None of us will meet that final reward in Jesus' name. One of our children has been going to school and she's uh, gone to school for um, secondary uh, one, two, three, junior secondary, and then uh, uh, senior secondary one, two. It's now in secondary three and about to take the exam. Something came upon him. Something came upon her and then uh, he withdrew from school. And everybody kept on pleading. He said, no, I'm not interested anymore. I cannot go on anymore. You spend five years, you spend five and a half years, and just to stay and finish, it says, no, I don't want to continue. I don't see the reason to continue. What do you see of such a child? She's wasted five and a half years. Think about us as leaders who have been feeding the people of God for two years, for five years, and for seven years, and for maybe nine years, and something happens, and something just came upon such a pastor and such a leader, and he says, this is too much. If I cannot have my way, I'm not doing any other thing. If I cannot, you know, beat anyone I have and oppress anyone I have and abuse anyone I have, I want to abuse and insult anyone. If I cannot control them like a military man controls the barrack, if I cannot do that, I'm not continuing. I must have my way. And because he could not have his way, he wants to withdraw. How about all the years you are put in? The Lord wants to find you so doing, feeding, and teaching, and leading the people of God until he comes. I pray you will not fall out. And you will not fall away. I pray that what you have committed yourself to, you will not allow self, you will not allow the flesh, you will not allow self-will and stop on nails to make you quit, you will not quit in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 28. Acts chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. There will be something that may want to rise up in you. The depravity that Christ has taken away at the point of sanctification. The self-will that Christ has taken away at the point of sanctification. And all that uh, kind of a uh, rugged personality uh, that has been taken away during the time of sanctification. That thing may want to come back. You want to have your way again. You want to be rough again. You want to be uncontrollable again. You want to be incorrigible again. Take heed unto yourselves. Unto yourself. 
check your own spiritual life. Check your own attitude. Am I still following Christ? Christ is still moving on in love. Am I still walking in love? Christ is moving on and is equipping the people. Am I equipping the people? Christ is moving on. It's advancing the people. It's encouraging the people. It's moving them forward. Am I doing the same thing? Christ is discipling the people. Am I still discipling the people? Have I abandoned all those things? What I want to do now is to show that this is who I am and I want to now impose my personality. Christ is still going on and is still um, kind of uh, going with the people. It's exemplifying his message. It talks about humility and it talks about loneliness and it talks about meekness and it's still exemplifying that. What are you doing? What are you doing? Have you forgotten? You have to follow Christ in your leadership. Are you reproducing any good thing? Are you sacrificing anything at all? Are you still harvesting or have you stopped by the side of the road? Are you still instructing? Are you still persevering? Take heed unto yourself. Don't allow pride to come in. Don't allow haughtiness to come in. Don't allow high-mindedness to come in. Get rid of all that. All those things are not important. What's important is what the Lord has called us to do. That we keep on following Christ in leadership. God will help us. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. And to all the flock. You cannot turn your eyes away from this part of the flock. I can't talk to them. I won't talk to them. I won't do anything with them. They're all giving to you. And you have to lead everyone. You have to love everyone. And you have to transform everyone with the word of God and the word of life. They're hungry too. And you need to feed everyone. Take it unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. That's how precious the church is, the purchase of the Lord with the precious blood of Christ. Well then, if we're feeding the church, if we're feeding the flock, we're feeding uh, every individual, we're feeding uh, every family, we're feeding every section, and we're feeding them for life for life, that their lives, number one, they'll have eternal life, eternal life. If we're feeding them with the word of God and they're not saved, and every time somebody preaches salvation, they're raising up their hands, you're not feeding them. You must so feed them that they know, that they know, that they know that they have eternal life. They are born again. They know their names are written in the book of life. And then you are feeding them their victorious life. Victorious life. The life that is victorious above sin. Not that we go on teaching the same thing, the same thing over and over. And the people do not know how to resist the devil. How to have the victory. Victory over sin, victory over sickness, and victory over Satan. That the people were teaching you know, after all these many years, they have headache, they have to look for somebody to pray for them. And they have a running tummy, they have to look for somebody to pray for them. And they have, a, you know, something in the night that knocked somewhere, and they have to look for, they want to go for deliverance. After you've been teaching them for 15 years, we need to teach them that they know that they have victorious life in Christ. We need to teach until they have conquering life, that they conquer everything that comes against them, they will conquer in Jesus' name. Well then, the teaching will give what kind of life should it give to the people we're teaching. Number one, undefiled life defiled life. If we're teaching properly, our people will know, our people will hear, and our people will stand righteous and holy. They will have undefiled life. Look at Psalm 119. I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 119. 
We're reading from verse 1. It says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Teach them to the point that they are undefiled. Teach them to the point they are uncompromising. They know the truth. Whether you are there or not, they know the truth. Whether members of deeper life are there with them or not, they know the truth and they will not compromise. And they will say, here is where I stand. And that's how to teach. That to teach them, they know what they believe. And whatever comes and whatever the challenge and whatever the trial, they will stand uncompromisingly living for the Lord. Daniel chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. His pastor was not there. His father was not there. His mother was not there. And all the people that could say, what are you doing there? Checking up on him. They were not there. But all the same, he had been taught to the point he could live an uncompromising life. We teach them to the point that they live unspotted lives. Unspotted lives. In James chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 27. James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God is this and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in the affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. To keep himself unspotted from the world. When we teach people, we teach them and they embrace what we teach. They believe what we teach. They live by what we teach. The grace of God is in them to live an unspotted life. Number four, unreprovable life. Unreprovable life in Colossians. I'm reading from chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 22. Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Unreprovable in his sight. Now that's what, what we're teaching people. We're not excusing sin. We're not excusing backsliding. We're not excusing waywardness. We're not excusing lawlessness. We so teach them that their lives are undefiled. Their lives are uncompromising. Their lives are unspotted. Their lives are unreprovable. Their lives are unfeigned. Unfeigned. They're not pretending. They're not pretending. They're not people that have eye service. When the pastor is there, this is how they behave. When the pastor is not there, this is how they behave. That's faint behavior. That's hypocritical behavior. It tells us in First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one, reading from verse twenty-two. This is the reason for teaching, and this is the goal of teaching. This is the result of teaching that the lives of the people we teach will be unfeigned, unpretending. In First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-two, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love on pretending love, on hypocritical love, on faint love of the brethren, see that she love one another with a pure heart fervently, and their lives are unblameable. Their lives are unblameable. The people we're teaching, if we teach them right, if we teach them correctly, and they accept, and they possess, and they personalize what we're teaching. It's not that, you know, because we're carrying, uh, kind of weep, and we're running after them, don't do this, don't do this, do this, and do that. We're not controlling them from outside, but from the inside. The Spirit of God in them is controlling them and directing them that this is what your life ought to be. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 10. Verse 10, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Paul the apostle said, when we come to you, 
We're coming to you for one reason. One reason only. We're going to look at your life and your profession of faith, in your behavior, your character, in your relationship with the Lord. We'll see what is lacking in your faith. We we'll want to perfect it. Why? Verse 13. To the end, for the purpose, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. That's what we're coming to do. And that's why we're teaching you. And that's the reason we want to give you the word of God so you'll be unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. We teach them so that their lives are unmovable. They're not shifting signs. They're not people that they're here today, they're there tomorrow, they're up today, they're down tomorrow. We teach them in such a way that they are unmovable. Unmovable. Whatever wind may blow, whatever challenge may come, whatever trial, temptation may come, they are unmovable. Check up on your converts. Check up on the people you have been teaching. Check up on the people you have been leading. Check up on members of your local church. Are they like this? Are you teaching them to have eternal life? Are you teaching them to have victorious life? Are you teaching them to have conquering life? Are you producing in them through the grace of God an undefiled life, an uncompromising life, an unspotted life, an unreprovable life, an unfeigned life, an unblameable life, an unmovable life? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, steadfast, unmovable. Not that we we'll find them at the beginning of the year; they are all there. Then when we we'll come to the middle of the year, they're no more there again. Teach in such a way that the people you are teaching they have conviction. And whether you are there with them in their houses or not will not matter. They are unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as she know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor will not be in vain. My labor will not be in vain. Say it for yourself, my labor will not be in vain. Point number two now, for bearing like Christ in lowliness, and meekness for bearing like Christ in lowliness and meekness. There is a way leadership in the church, leadership following after the example of Christ will comport itself. There is the kind of leadership in the world that is boisterous, overpowering, imposing, bullying, treading on people, pushing people down so they can go their way. Leadership in the church doesn't do that. Why? Because Christ did not live that way. And Christ did not lead that way. And Christ did not show that kind of example. The example he showed, look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, we're reading from verse 29. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. As you lead, don't take for granted you know what to do. And don't do the same old thing that you did in the old year. But now as we come to this new year, and you say, I'm following after Christ, the example of Christ, the leadership style of Christ, I want to be more and more like Christ. He said, take my yoke upon you. The yoke will restrain you. The yoke will restrict you. The yoke will make you go the straight line and the straight path you ought to go. You are yoked with Christ in the ministry. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You learn of Christ. What will Christ do? How will Christ do it? 
how will Christ lead? How will Christ direct people? How will Christ influence people? It says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. That's the Lord. That's the Lord. I am meek and lowly in heart. It says, as I lead, as I teach, as I live from my heart, I'm lowly in the heart. I am meek in the heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. There's no point leading other people and then you become restless. There's no point leading other people and then you become doubtful of your getting to heaven. There's no point leading other people and having your own way and then you go astray and Jesus says, huh, you're following a stranger, you're not following me. If you are following me, your leadership style will have lowliness and will have meekness. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 2. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 2. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2, it says, This is how to lead with all lowliness and meekness. That's how to lead. That's how to live. That's how to, how to comport yourself. That's how to organize your life. But you know, a leader, a preacher, a pastor that never thinks of Christ in any situation, in any conflict in any community and in any things that happens in the local church and he has forgotten that he was placed there in leadership so he can follow the example of Christ he has forgotten and he's gone back to his old unconverted days what he used to do I used to live. He's gone back to what he used to do when he was senior prefect or senior girl in a secondary school without salvation. And he says, This is how I'm going to lead. I'll bring them at a standstill and I will show them this is what to do. The Lord Jesus said, Learn of me now. It's my church, it's my flock, they're my sheep. They are my ministers, they are my people, and I placed you there so you will do what I would have done if I were there. I would lead in lowliness and meekness. And what you should do is to also lead in lowliness and meekness. Look at that verse too. With all lowliness, all lowliness. What does that mean? There are people below you in status in social circle and in education they're below you that's a kind of loneliness you ought to have there are people like your colleagues they are at par with you and they are, they have the same knowledge you have certificates you have and they are just like you loneliness all loneliness there are people of a different gender you are a man and they are women Yet all the same with all lowliness. You are an adult and they are young. With all lowliness, we don't come as if we come with such a bullying authority. And when we come, the people are afraid. Uh -huh. They know I'm the leader because they are trembling. Loneliness doesn't make anybody to tremble. There are people who are above you in age. They are above you in education. They are above you in knowledge and understanding. And when you lead them, you lead with all loneliness and with meekness. That's what the Word of God says. And if your leadership style and if your approach is different from that, then you have missed the way. If you are not leading like Christ, you know that when Christ comes, there will be no reward. You have wasted your life. I pray you will not waste your life. You have wasted your resources. I pray you will not waste your resources. All the sacrifices we have, everything we demonstrate, the self-denial, is all wasted. Once there's no lowliness and meekness, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering for bearing one another in love. 
that's leadership according to Christ's method, according to Christ's approach. We're coming to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or being glory, but in lowliness of mind. You see that? In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. If you're looking at yourself better than everybody else, that's pride, that's pride. There's no other word for that. And pride, those who are proud will be abased by the Lord. Pride will not have a way, will not have a place in the kingdom of God. That means then that Christ-like leadership, in Christ-like leadership, there's no room for L lawlessness. When you're meek and lowly, you'll not be lawless. I don't care what they say. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what the pastor thinks about this. I'm going to have my own way. That's lawlessness. That's not lowliness. In Christ's leadership, Christ-like leadership, there is no room for enmity. Enmity. Something had happened last year. Something had happened years before. And you're still having that in the heart. And your leadership now is that, okay, this happened. And they said, I'm not a leader. I come back now and I'm going to show people that I am a leader. That's not loneliness. The revenging of the people or somebody else somewhere at the headquarters has done against you. In Christ-like leadership, there's no room for enmity. In Christ-like leadership, there's no room for anger. You know, people, they're bitter, they're angry. And they say they're pastors. They're angry at this, they're angry at that. The tone of voice and the demeanor and the character, everything is like, you know, there is anger. That's not good. That's not right. And in Christian leadership, Christ-like leadership, there is no room for drunkenness. Drunk with power. Is drunk with position, is drunk with skill, is drunk with ability. And the position he has and the place he holds makes him drunk like wine. That's not leadership in the Bible sense that, you know, the, even the air, the atmosphere around him, the man is drunk. The woman is drunk. In Christian leadership, Christ-like leadership, uh, there is no room for extortion. Extortion, you know, because I'm a leader, I take this from that, I borrow that, from, I borrow this from that, and you're not paying back. And when the fellow confronts you, hey, don't talk to me like that, I'm a leader. Because I owe you a few thousands, a few millions, you're talking to me like that, if you don't know, I will tell you, I'm pastor of deeper life. Ah, is that so? A pastor is a debtor. And you will not pay back. And you extort people. In Christ-like leadership, there's no room for rebellion. There's no room for rioting. There's no room for strife in Christ-like leadership. He wants us to be lowly, and he wants us to be meek. In Christ-like leadership, there is no room for hypocrisy you will not be hypocritical. Who you are will be who you are. Anywhere you are. You are gentle here. You are gentle there. You are lowly here. You are lowly there. You are meek here. You are meek over there. In Christian Christ-like leadership, there's no room for idolatry. Idolatry. You see, there are people, they idolize people. And whatever that person says, even though that thing is wrong, they so idolize a man, they so idolize a woman that they go astray, they derail from the path of Christ. In Christ-like leadership, there is no room for idolatry. In Christ-like leadership, there is no room for pride. You see, when you are corrected, and you deliberately come back and do exactly the same thing you know, as pride. You're saying, you know, I'm untouchable. I'm unteachable. You must complete that sentence. So you are unusable. 
if you are unteachable and you are untouchable, you must understand God will not use you. That's pride. Unteachable, untouchable, unusable. So, as we talk about Christ's leadership, Christ's leadership will not admit El Lucifer, the one who comes and he says, I am all in all. I will exalt my throne above the throne of God. I will, I will, I will. There's no room in Christ's leadership and in Christ's flock for licentious Lucifer. In Christ's leadership, Christ will not admit Esau, the one whose stomach is the number one. What am I going to do with the birthright? When, once I'm hungry, the people that will abandon every other thing, abandon ministry, abandon preaching, abandon work, abandon their privilege because they are hungry. Esau, there's no room and there is no place for Christ like Christ leadership in Esau. There's no place like for Absalom. Absalom, that's all he wants is just to, you know, if you, they brought your case to me, I would judge you right. But you know, daddy doesn't have assistant. And if I were made the assistant, I will tell you, I will show you what I can do. And stole the hearts of the people away. There's no place for abominable Absalom in Christ's leadership. There's no place for diotrephes. Bullying on people, scattering people, trading on people, walking on people, and he's saying, I am the one here. Nobody can touch me. Nobody can remove me. And if you are not happy, then you can go out. You cannot do anything unless I say, do it. And anyone coming from anywhere, John coming from the headquarters, Peter coming from the headquarters, anybody coming, tell them before they come, I stand in here and nobody can dictate anything to me. Do Trephus, there's no place in the kingdom of God. There's no place in the leadership for Diotrephes. There's no place for a feminine Eli. The one that is just in children. I hear reports about you. I hope uh, these things uh, you change. You know, if uh, somebody has a quarrel with somebody, uh, they can easily say to you, but if God has something against you, a feminine cannot stand and did not have any backbone. There's no place for Eli in leadership in the church. There's no place for Reuben. Reuben, the excellency of my strength, but unstable as water, unstable. You cannot depend upon him. He's my firstborn, and yet he's unstable as water. Rootless Reuben, no root, no standing. And because he has no root, the wind will blow him. I pray you'll not be like that. There's no place for Saul. Self centered soul wait for seven days and then when I saw that you didn't come at the seventh day that's why I took laws into my hand there's no room for that and then there's no room for Haman hardened Haman is busy setting gallows for this and setting gallows for that. Anybody who does not bend down to him, anybody who does not pe pe prostrate or kneel down, he says, I cannot even bear. You know, I came and they will not bend down to me. And there's no place for Haman, hardened Haman, in the leadership of the church. There's no room for Iscariot. You know, Iscariot, incorrigible Iscariot. I tell you, that one of you will betray me. And he said, who is he? Who is this? Is the man that I put his soap in his mouth. And he put his soap in his mouth. And Jesus said, is carried. Judas is carried. You're still bent on doing what you are going to do. Okay, go and do it. But you know, it was better you were not born. There's no place for pilate. Place seeking pilate. The pilot that will know, I find no fault in him. But he must use Jesus to reconcile with Herod, Pilate. He must use Jesus to appease the bloodthirsty 
Jews. And then he brought a bowl of water. I want to show you, I don't have any hands in this. And then he washed his hand and he still scorched him. And he delivered him to be crucified. There's no place for a pilot who knows the truth, who cannot stand upon the truth, and is washing his hand. I'm innocent. No, you are not innocent. I pray it will not be like that. The attitude and the action of Lucifer, of Esau, of Absalom, of Diotrephes, of Eli, of Reuben, of Saul, of Haman, of Iscariot, of Pilate, disqualifies us from leadership. This is a new year. I want to make sure that at the beginning of the year, all this is a cleanse from our lives and from our leadership in Jesus' name. Did anybody say amen over there? Yeah. Now we come to point number three, fruit bearing for Christ with love and maturity. Fruit bearing for Christ with love, with love and maturity. Now, after these many years in leadership, we shouldn't be acting, we shouldn't be behaving as if we were just, Johnny just come. We just came into leadership. And we've never had anything about leadership. And life should be different. And leadership should be different. And we should come to the year 2020 with a new zeal and with a new love and with a new maturity and lead and save I have this chance again. I'm going to make use of this chance and I will lead the way that reward will come eventually. I pray God grants us new grace, great grace, higher grace, dependable grace in Jesus' name. And let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 7. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. It says in verse 7, But we were gentle among you. Paul, a change had taken place. This is the man before his conversion. He will run into houses, rush into houses. Any man, any woman, any youth, he got there, following after the way of Christ. He had no sympathy. He had no love. He had no consideration. For the aged or for the young, for the man or the woman. But now we were gentle among you. That's evidence of conversion. That's the evidence of grace. That's the evidence of sanctification. We were gentle among you as the nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you. We were willing to have imparted unto you not only the gospel, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you are dear unto us. Because you are dear unto us. A pastor shall count every member of the church precious and dear and then be willing to impart his very life unto that member. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable to any of you. We preached the gospel, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. You see, the love we have will make us to consider our leadership, will make us to consider the way we handle people, the way we relate with people, and the things we do. We will not deliberately do anything to any member, to any minister, to the ones who are junior to us, to the one at power with us, and to the one above us, in any way that will not show the love of Christ and the maturity of the Christian minister. Well then, a Christian leadership would have, number one, compassionate leadership. Compassionate leadership. We're leaders, but we're compassionate. We're leaders, we have good hearts. We're leaders, we have empathy we have sympathy we have compassionate leadership number two 
considerate leadership. Considerate. We consider those who are young. We consider those who are widows. We consider those who are sick. We consider those who are poor. We are considerate in, uh, you know, doling out commandments and telling them, do this and do this. We count the people more important than our little joy, our little position. We count the people. We to use our position to solve their problems. We to use our position to help them and to lift them up. Our leadership will be considerate leadership. Number three, conciliatory leadership will not have the attitude of the method of divide and rule. Divide and rule. Go to this one and tell them something bad about the other group and go to the other group, tell this other one something bad and then act in a way to divide so that we'll get the people to rule. No conciliatory. You reconcile people and you make people love each other. What do you, what do you lose? If we love each other, what do you lose if there's no fight? What do you lose if there's no strife? What do you lose if we all love Christ and Christ loves us and we all are going on in love? What do you lose? There must be conciliatory leadership. There must be corrective leadership. Corrective leadership. We're there as leaders. Why? Because the people are not perfect. And you want to get to them to perfect whatever is wrong in their lives. What's wrong in their family? What's wrong in their attitude to work? What's wrong in their ethics? What's wrong in their disposition? What's wrong in their relationship with other members of the church? Your leadership should be corrective, corrective leadership, constructive leadership. Number five, you're constructing. You're not demolishing. You're not destroying. You're not scattering. You're not making people's life unworthy and scattered. You're not making people to get so much in despair. They want to go and commit suicide. You're constructive. And if you're going to be constructive, you have to have a vision. You have to have a goal. You have to have an ideal. This is the way their life should be. Look at an architect. He sees a vacant land or he sees a ramshackled building and then he has a vision. He has a mind. I'm going to put a building like this on that same person of land. And then he breaks down that ramshackled building and constructively raises up something new. That's what we should do in people's lives. Look at their lives. They are ruined and they are rich. And they, are, they don't amount to anything. And you go to them because you are the leader. And you have constructive influence over them. Number six is courageous leadership. Courageous leadership. That no matter what. And no matter the situation. And no matter how fiery or fearful that person is. Fearsome. That person is. You you know, God has sent you to him. God has sent you to her and courageously in your leadership, you begin to transform their lives by the word that will make their lives better. Number one is compassionate leadership. Number two is considerate leadership. Number three is conciliatory leadership. Number four is corrective leadership. Number five, constructive leadership. Number six, courageous leadership. Number seven, contagious leadership. If we lead like that, people see us, people see our lives, and people see that this year, 2020, we are more and more and more like Christ. It will spill over them. It will influence them. That love, that maturity, that leadership will be contagious, and the church, the whole flock, will be better for it in Jesus' name. The Lord will do it more in us, more in you. More in everyone. And the Lord will make us the leader. He has called us to be following after the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that possible? I said, is that possible? Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Take all that we have learned today. 
on leading the flock of Christ with Christ like leadership. Let's really pray. Let's really pray. And the Lord will do it in every one of our lives.